Your Excellences, Honorable Cabinet Ministers in Bhutan, Members of Parliament in Bhutan, dear Dr. Emela Hartz, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, dear colleagues. It is my privilege to open this online event also on behalf of my, the name, my colleagues. My name is Mike Schnieren as the Program Executive of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. It is my honor to welcome you to participate in an online event titled Role of Women in Modern Bhutanese Society. The Friedrich Naumann Foundation is a German political foundation that promotes liberal values working in areas of good governance, rules of law, education and freedom market economy. We achieve our goals by political consultancy, political dialogues and civic education. Since the beginning of this year, our office in New Delhi, which is part of the FNF regional office in South Asia, has been exploring the possibility to start activities in Bhutan. We started by organizing a webinar on liberty and happiness in Bhutan, for which we got overwhelming response, and this motivated us. We are pleased to share that we are already have identified a partner in Bhutan, and we are supporting them on activities to promote active citizenship and good governance. Bhutan has been a prime example of how good governance can form the backbone of democracy if nurtured deftly in the global world. Through good leadership and foresight, Bhutan has carved out an exemplary approach to development. Germany and Bhutan has been pursuing relations for several years, even in the absence of diplomatic relations. Germany has been supporting Bhutan from the European Union and it's the largest contributor to its union budget. People to people contact between Bhutan and Germany also increased over the years. However, recently from last year, November, 2020, both the countries announced on diplomatic relations. With um, the establishment of diplomatic relations, the two ambassadors expresses the desire for further, further deepened the friendship and cooperation between the two countries. Bhutan's program is largely informed by the Buddhist philosophy of seeking the right causes and conditions that give rise uh, to happiness. This was encapsulated in gross national happiness. Women in Bhutan enjoy a better status in society and are actively contributing to the economy in present days by taking up various roles in different sectors. Today's session will focus on the role of women in modern Bhutanese society and how through their multitasking skills have become exceptional leaders in their respective fields. We are anticipate that by this online event, Friedrich Naumann Foundation will enhance the visibility of Bhutan with, within Germany and among the German public. My sincere thanks to our panelists, Ms. Aum Sonam Wang Mo, also to Aum um, Panchok Chodan and Chering Dolka for agreeing to be part of this panel. We are all delighted to have you here and to know your views from your experience. Thank you also to Nam Gai Sam for agreeing to moderate the sessions. I would like to make a special mention and thanks to Mr. Reinhard Wolf from the German Bhutan Himalaya Society based out of Germany for this special support and giving his insights on Bhutan, as well as supporting us in communicating the event to a wider range. It is now my pleasure to hand over the microphone to the vice president of the German Bhutan um, Himalaya Society, Dr. Emela Hartz. Ms. Hartz has lived in Bhutan for many years knows this country very well and leads the organization as a vice president. The German Bhutan Himalaya Society has been working for Bhutan since 1984. Their office is based out of Cologne in Germany. This organization is one of the oldest friendship societies for Bhutan. The main objective of this organization is to create mutual understanding and to know each other better. They are supporting guests from Bhutan for various lectures and information events exhibition, study tours, and support of the previous Bhutan's historical heritage. Yimis Hartz, we are now looking forward to your address and over to you. A very warm welcome to everybody. I'm very happy that I'm now to, today speaking to so many people who I met already in Bhutan or um, who I have known for many years who I'm a friend with. 
Um, I represent today the German Bhutan Himalaya Society. And um, as we have already learned, this is a group of 150 people who are headed by a voluntary board of professionals, the main, the president of our society, Mr. Reinhard Wolf, he is by profession a forester and he has worked throughout his professional life in many countries of the globe, including African countries, but also in Asia and in Bhutan. He has worked for five years in Lovesa in a social forestry project. We have on our board Herbert Küster. He is a very experienced former administrator in many ministries of the German government. And he uh, has a profound knowledge of democratic institutions and democratic processes. We have on board a woman who looks after our finances, uh, Brigitte Eisenach. Uh, she has done a wonderful job in sort of channeling funds from Germany to Bhutan and looking after the finances of our society. And I myself, I'm an agriculturist I have worked for many years in the area of traditional medicine and I have lived and worked in Bhutan for 17 years. I have two, two children, two boys who are both born and raised in Bhutan. So I sort of represent this um, world citizenship. You know, we have lived in Asia and we live now in Europe. So I have met many people, many um, in, in Bhutan and of course, many women. I would like to, I would, I would like to uh, uh, mention also that the German Bhutan Himalaya Society has a very good network. And we are very proud to say that we have good connections to the Bhutanese embassy in Brussels. So this network and the support from the from the, uh, this diplomatic support from the embassy in Brussels helps us to really uh, carry out projects in Bhutan. So, um, back to our uh, subject of today, the women of Bhutan. Um, as, as we have already heard, women have a very high sort of status in Bhutan, higher than in other Asian countries and then in other countries of the world even. So I remember one very strong woman, which is Dasho Dawadum. She passed away a couple of years ago, but she was honored by the third king of Bhutan as the first Ramjang, that is sort of like an executive um, chief of a ministry. And she has founded back in, in the 1980s, I think, the National Women Association of Bhutan. So I have known her personally, and I think she was one of the very strong women of Bhutan. I have also met um, Nitin Zangmo, who has led the Anti-Corruption Commission of Bhutan. She has fought very fierce battles against a lot of things which did not go so well in Bhutan. And she is one of the very strong women who was awarded the, um, the sword by the fourth king of Bhutan. She is a Dasho. So Dasho Dawadum and Amnit Zangmo both are very, very strong women who are sort of uh, demonstrate what positions women can have in Bhutan. <clears throat> but of course, not everybody has such a high position and not many women are involved in politics of modern Bhutan. Most women are, as all over the world, housewives, farmers, entrepreneurs, and women need to work a lot. You know, they are multitasking all the time. They have to educate the children. They have to look after the income of the family and uh, it's not, it's definitely not an easy life, you know? And I think um, the women um, uh, have, have difficulties, especially when we consider that um, the rural urban migration is, a very, is very high in Bhutan. Many rural families leave their farms and move into the towns. 
And that is the moment where the old traditions of living together, many generations living in one house, break apart. And I see most of the problems coming from that situation that not grandma and grandma are looking after the children anymore because in a small little flat in the town, it's not possible to live with two or three or four generations under one roof. So I think um, the modern society is facing problems in, res in regard to the, to the situation of women. And I think this seminar is one way of trying to address this situation and maybe finding solutions also. I'm absolutely certain that women in Bhutan are so strong, they will overcome these difficulties and with sufficient support from the government, I'm sure that that will be, uh, yeah, a new step into the future. I think um, we will have very interesting speakers today in the evening and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. And um, yeah, I wish this event a very good outcome. Tashi Delek. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hartz, for your greetings, for your address and for your interesting introduction. Before we start the panel discussion, I would like to take you to a trip to Bhutan, although not really virtual. So here is a less than two minute short video. This footage depicts life in Bhutan from a baby, a girl, a mother, a farmer, nurse, security and professional. It strings a thread on many lifespans of women from a young age till she grows old, touching lives and nature around her and contributing the best way she can. The song is broadly about the connectivity of lives and how we should respect the past and our parents to create harmony in the future. This video is produced by Chongling. Chongling is a self-taught cinematographer, editor and photographer. He has edited short films like The Red Door, and worked as a line producer from the critically acclaimed feature film, The Red Fallows. He is also a founder of Zoom Out Productions, a multimedia production based in Timpu, in Bhutan. So Marco, please film up.
Yeah, what for impressive pictures, which now brings us to our next item on the program. It is now my pleasure to open the discussion and give the microphone over to Nam Gai Sam, who will guide us through the evening. Let me briefly, before I do that, introduce Ms. Sam with a few words. Nam Gai Sam is the executive director of um, the Journalists Association of Bhutan, a non-political and non-profit organization with overarching mandates are to pro promote professionalism in journalism, uphold freedom of expressions, protect and promote the right to information and protect journalism from hazards, such as threats, harassments, legislation, etc. Ms. Sam is an independent journalist with more than a decade experience in all forms of media. She's trainer and consultant for media and gender issues. She's a mental health advocate and also LGBTIQ ally as well. She is also a young Asian leader and a Fulbright Humphrey Fellow. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, the discussion is in the best hands. Dear Ms. Sam, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. Um, I do hope it's in the best hands. I do aspire to be in the best hands and in the best mouth tonight. Um, thank you so much for having this panel, Frederick Nauman Foundation. I think um, it's such a wonderful platform, uh, especially for the women who are on the panel. It's such a pleasure and a privilege of mine to be able to moderate this panel of women that I admire deeply and respect as well. Um, before I start, I would like to introduce our panelists. I'm sure some of you may have already seen the bios. If you haven't, I will just run through it in no particular order. So we have Am Sona Mongmo, and Am basically it's out of respect and she's older than me. Um, it's not really a title, but um, we ref uh, refer to somebody older as Am. So Am Sona Mongmo is a business person and social worker uh, who's um, uh, she has worked in the tourism industry for decades and is involved in various social enterprises and charity projects in Bhutan. She is deeply dedicated to supporting rural communities and supports um, local operations with her vast experience and large network. She is also the founder of Udruk, among the earliest companies in the country to provide travel related services. Udruk was established in the year 1985. That is the year of my birth. <laughs> so um, Sonam has been around for a lot of, um, for, um, for many years and a lot of experiences to share as you will see um, tonight on the panel. Um, Second on the panel is Am Fin Sok Choden. She is a HomeNet South Asia board member as a gender consultant with extensive national, regional, international experience and development. She is actively engaged in the area of women's empowerment with a particular focus on economic and political empowerment. In her role as the head of BNU, Bhutan Network for Empowering Women, a civil society organization that empowers women in order to mobilize, motivate, and facilitate women's participation in all form forums of development and governance, she travels and meets rural women in all nooks and corners of Bhutan. She is also the honorary consul of the Netherlands in Bhutan. We finally have um, Amstring Dolker. She is the executive director of Renew, which uh, stands for Respect, Educate, Nurture, and Empower Women. So Renew is founded by Her Majesty the Queen Mother Sangye Choden Wangchuk um, in the year 2004. It is a nonprofit organization uh, which works on empowering survivors of domestic violence, and gender-based violence by enabling them to be financially sustainable and emotionally independent individuals um, towards a socially productive member of society. She brings with her 26 years of experience working in the social sector. She started her career with the Ministry of Education in 1992 and gradually started working for Renew since um, 2004. And um, I have worked with both Am Tsering as well as Am Fin Sok. Uh, I think that will come out as uh, we talk in the panel. I haven't had a chance to work with Am Sona Wangmo, but I've heard such great things about her and there are so many great things to share about her tonight as well. Um, just some housekeeping before we start the panel. Um, we're going to have at least two to three questions uh, for every panelist. After that, we'll open up uh, for questions. Um, then we will return to the panel again and to my questions. If there aren't questions, we will continue um, as a Q&A on the panel. Uh, but uh, feel free to send in your questions um, uh, even while we are speaking and then we'll take in um, questions in between so that everybody's engaged and not feeling left out. Um, and if you're joining from Bhutan, it's pretty late. South Asia, it's quite late um, and not too late in Germany and in other parts of the world uh, in the West. So do feel free to send in the questions and we'll take them in as we um, go on with our panel discussion. 
So I'm um, returning to our topic of discussion for tonight, role of women in modern Bhutanese society. Well, we are a society in transition, so even our roles as women, men, and other, other genders are in transition too. While not all transitions are smooth, in the Bhutanese context, most of it has been gradual and orderly. There hasn't been much disruption. I would be echoing the sentiments of many Bhutanese women that it is only due to the far-sighted leadership of our kings that Bhutanese women have come this far. Even before the SDGs underscored gender equality, it was a priority in our development goals. Upon royal command, the National Commission for Women and Children was established. Uh, women leaders are appointed to eminent positions in parliament and at executive level, levels, all under royal leadership as well. The appointment of female eminent members to parliament is particularly dear to me and to Amphansuk because there were barely any elected women um, at the time. And I'm sure Amphansuk will have so much more to share on this. Um, Bhutanese women enjoy far greater social and legal status than our South Asian counterparts, as we've heard before uh, from Dr. Armala. Um, there's, um, while we, we enjoy um, this status, but um, uh, thanks, thanks to being a matrilineal society, um, and also unlike in other parts of South Asia, the husband usually moves into the wife's home and not vice versa. Opening up to the world has had both its pros and cons. While some parts of our minds have broadened, some parts have narrowed, sadly. Bhutan was never colonized, but we've inherited a colonial legislature and a little bit of the mindset, mostly from our good friend and neighbor, India, where men are placed front and center in all of this. Yes, there have been some losses, but the gains have been immense. Before modern education, women were not educated. Only boys were educated in the monasteries. The first king of Bhutan introduced modern education in the early 1900s. There are hilarious anecdotes of parents hiding their daughters from officials under large bamboo baskets to not send them to school when modern education first began. Officials would visit families door to door to ask that children be sent to schools. Incredible to think how far we've come in the last 100 years. I remember a teacher of mine telling me this when I was in the eighth standard. Um, I was studying in Bhutan at that time. The rest of the world learned to crawl, walk, cycle, drive, and then fly. But for Bhutan, we leapt from crawling to driving and flying. Development and growth have happened by leaps and bounds. Bhutan will be graduating from being a least developed country in 2023 as well. For the uninitiated, education and healthcare are universal in Bhutan. In modern Bhutan, we have women topping important exams. We have female space engineers. One of them you saw in the video just a while earlier, she was speaking, she was standing at a podium. We have coders. We have women powering the civil society sector. You will see what I mean when our panelists begin speaking. Uh, we have a woman leading the health ministry. A health minister has worked hard to ensure we've had only two deaths from COVID-19 till date and live in a virtually pandemic free country, knock on wood. Women have made their mark and continue to trailblaze in various sectors. Our panelists today will not only bear testimony to this, but are real life examples. I wish I could say the same, uh, I, I wish I could say the situation is the same for women in media, but it is not as rosy. Male journalists outnumber women journalists by three times. Jab's last record tells us we have 92 male journalists and 30 female journalists. This gender imbalance reflects in the leadership too. Our media is young compared to elsewhere in the world. The oldest media, our national newspaper, Quincel, is only a little over five decades old. Despite it being young, we haven't been as progressive in recognizing female leadership, even when there is the potential. The national newspaper, Quincel, had its first female chief editor in 2018. The national broadcaster, BBS, has still not seen a female newsroom chief, but it did have a female managing director in 2008. As you can see, there have been great strides in some areas and baby steps in others. What can be said though, is there's been movement forward. We have women and girls changing the face of Putinese women and modern Putinese society for the better. Allow me to invite our first speaker, Amphin Sok Chodin, to share her thoughts on the evolution of Putinese women and our roles in the public sphere with particular focus on governance and democracy, La Amphin Sok. I think uh, that was a beautiful I think, introduction to our country and the situation of women. I think actually you've covered a lot. Uh, so I will also try to do my best. Uh, basically, I think I want to start with uh, a quote you know, from uh, Madame 
you know, Maudlin Albright, with all, whom all of us know and heard about, the first female Secretary of State in the history of the United States, she once said that success without democracy is improbable. Democracy without women is impossible. So let me also try to, you know, uh, shed some light on the evolving situation of women in our young democratic kingdom a bit more generally and also touch on the specifics, I think, of women in politics. Nambi has already actually touched a lot on the general part, so I probably will uh, zoom in much more on the, the specifics. Um, basically, uh, you know, Bhutan, I think, as already introduced by the former, you know, uh, speakers like uh, Dr. Irmila and uh, and then the uh, the video, and also by Namge, uh, we are basically a very, uh, you know, living in a very young kingdom that has survived, you know, deep in the folds and embrace of the mighty Himalayas, landlocked, isolated, and yet shaped, uh, you know, destiny and emerged to carve out our own unique identity on the global stage. Thanks, I think, largely to our enlightened and visionary kings, starting from the first king onwards, and today we are with the fifth king. Despite our you know, very small physical presence and very insignificant economic contribution to the world, I think we are still standing out uh, you know, as a proud nation. And uh, parliamentary democracy was introduced in this country in the year 2008, not, you know, again, uh, unlike in other countries, not by a grassroots level revolution, but from the top down as a gift from the golden throne to empower citizens to further shape our future and strengthen the country. Uh, because our kings, uh, you know, decided that it is the right moment, and you know, although people were still not yet enlightened enough, uh, the, our kings were, so they decided to, you know, shower this uh, gift on us. We are still adjusting to this new system of governance, and of course, our democratic culture, along with the deeper awareness and consciousness that comes along uh, with, uh, you know, introduction of democracy, is still in transition if I may say so, as Namgis also said it, said it, at least I think when it comes, uh, when it concerns, I think the role of women within the bigger picture of democracy in Bhutan, it is definitely still in transition. It's really work in progress as uh, you, know, you will see and you've heard already. After three very peaceful, successful and you know, smooth democratic parliamentary elections uh, since 2008, and now we are on the eve of the third local government elections on the 22nd of this month. You know, I think it is uh, pretty safe to say that uh, political discourse in Bhutan remains very largely very superficial and politics merely a role play, I would say, highly personalized and very, very male dominated as you, can, you could also, you know, uh, pick up from the data that Namgi shared, uh, you know, so this is against, you know, uh, the background of, you know, in the land of gross national happiness, as Bhutan is, you know, famous for, where, you know, our, where our development philosophy is guided by, uh, you know, Buddhist uh, you know, principles of gross national happiness, uh, which was conceptualized by our fourth king, where more, more than 50% of the population is female where you know, matrilineal customs dominate our local culture uh, and the way of life within which women inherit property, pass on their daughter, you know, the properties to daughters, so mothers to daughters, as Namgi was also mentioning, where also our men actually, especially I know coming from Western Bhutan, men take a lot of pride in this fact that they take nothing from the house, but they try to give back uh, you know, to the sisters and uh, members of the family that live behind in their, in their, you know, maternal home, where it is normal for grooms to move into the homes of their brides, where, you know, women are very much in charge of the home and affairs around the house, where the girl child is a favored child and a wanted child, unlike, you know, in our neighboring countries, where gender relations are highly egalitarian, and, you know, so this is, you know, uh, such a progressive, almost enviable, I'm sure, by, you know, as seen by many, and also almost mythical image, you know, compared to the status of women and girls in our immediate neighborhood, in South Asia, at least, you know. 
But yet against this background, you know, it will surprise you to know that it is still a very big deal to see or find women in leadership positions. So at another level, you know, despite that very favorable, very mythically, you know, very romantic situation of women and girls in Bhutan, one can safely say that Bhutan is also no different from the rest of the world. If, especially if we view you know, through the magnifying glass and through the gender lens much more closely. To give a, you know, a better sense of this uh, with some data, um, I, uh, you know, at the, as I said earlier, uh, you know, we had the first, uh, I think, uh, parliamentary elections in 2008. And at that time, uh, we, uh, you know, achieved 10 women in a seat and our parliament has 72 seats, uh, 25 seats in the upper house and uh, 47 seats in the lower house, uh, which is the house of Rep people's representatives. And uh, in that, in 2008, after the first parliamentary elections, we had 10 women uh, sitting there in the parliament. Uh, so which meant uh, we had something like 14%, 13.88% women in parliament. Out of that 10, eight were elected and two appointed by the king, the eminent members that Namgye you know, referred to. Uh, in the upper house of the parliament, which is called the National Council, uh, you know, the 20 districts elect a member each, and then there are five seats uh, appointed by the king. And uh, out of the five uh, seats, his majesty has always ensured right from the very beginning to appoint two women out of the five seats. So, you know, that has been a savior for us because at the second parliamentary elections in 2013, there was a huge backslide, you know. We uh, went down from 10 women in the parliament to six women. Uh, so the percentage of women representation actually fell from almost 14% to 8%, uh, which meant only four were elected and two again eminent members. Now today, uh, after the third parliamentary elections of 2018, we have, uh, you know, achieved the highest ever Bhutan has seen in our history, you know, both uh, pre-introduction of democracy as well as post. We have 11 women currently in the parliament, uh, so it's 15.3% highest ever, uh, out of which, again, uh, out of the eight, uh, three are in the upper house in the National Council and eight are in the uh, National Assembly. And uh, that's the parliament. Uh, but then across the country in the 205 uh, local governments, uh, again, every five years we go in for uh, you know, democratic elections. And in 2011, after the first local government elections, uh, you know, there's a pool of something like around 1,500 uh, Roughly, uh, I, I rounded off to 1,500, but actually it's about 1,454 seats in the local governments around the country. Imagine out of 1,454, only 98 were women. And so that gave us 6.9% as a women representation, but actually at the highest level in the local government, uh, the most prized position, who is the real decision maker in each local government, we call it the GAP. Uh, which is like a chairperson of the local government. There was only one woman elected uh, in 2011. So, you know, in terms of percentage at the highest level in local government, we only achieved 0.5%. Now, in 2016, when we had the second local elections, we managed to double that, of course, uh, with a lot of effort uh, that especially my organization put in. Uh, of mobilizing and you know preparing women for the elections, uh, we managed to double it. So, which means we only managed to get two women elected in that election uh, at the highest level. But otherwise, uh, overall, uh, from six point nine percent, we now came to eleven point six percent, which means uh, we managed to get one hundred and seventy eight women elected in the local governments. So, I mean, overall, you know, I mean, as it is always said. 50% of the population in any country at any given time, you know, uh, is women. And so is so it is in Bhutan too, sometimes uh, in fact, 51% too. So 50% of the population is basically being represented uh, at the highest, you know, uh, level uh, or in decision-making positions, especially in elected offices. Let's say the parliament by 
and in the local governments by only less than 1% in, you know. Uh, in the cabinet, we have out of 10 uh, seats, we have, uh, you know, only uh, one uh, woman, uh, uh, you know, minister, who's the health minister, whom Namge just mentioned. And in the highest level of the civil service uh, in the government, um, after a very long, long period, we finally have achieved 20% in the sense we have, uh, you know, His Majesty the King appointed two uh, female secretaries uh, of the government. So finally, we have 20% there. And that position, uh, for a very long time, we haven't had women there. And uh, in the constitutional posts, uh, also, at the highest level, like in the, you know, we have four constitutional bodies like the anti corruption, the election commission, the Royal audit authority, and the Royal Civil Service Commission. And in those uh, positions, the in the chair position, we, currently we are like 50% women because two of them, the anti corruption and uh, the Royal Civil Service Commission, are headed by women. And uh, the remaining in the amongst the second, uh, the deputy level, the commissioners, we have something like 12% women because there's only one out of seven who's a woman. So on an average, actually, when I put all, you know, the uh, organizations uh, at the highest level together and take an average of women, uh, you know, at uh, the highest level, it basically translates roughly into an average of something like 17, 18% women uh, in the leadership level in Bhutan, you know, across the board, if you take elected and the civil service, etc. So, you know, then, you know, when you look at, uh, when you see this kind of data, uh, then, you know, it uh, makes you doubt because um, I remember a few years, some years ago, in an uh, article for Druk Journal saying that I had myself uh, co-authored, and I said, actually, it's a myth of equality, you know, on one hand, as I mentioned, uh, pre presented in the beginning, you know, it's such a mythical, you know, almost unimaginable situation where everything sounds so favorable and is so good. And, and, and that is also not cooked up, you know, it's really real uh, of a very egalitarian, you know, very favorable, uh, strong position of women in Bhutanese society. And it's all there, those pieces are there, but yet, you know, it is not really, uh, you know, that myth of, you know, gender equality or equality in society is not so much in sync with these realities today as we speak from a data point of view, you know. When you look at the statistics, then they don't really add up. So, you know, as I, uh, I put it in that particular article, I remember saying it's really, you know, for Bhutan, we are really a... Uh, a typical case of, you know, metrilineal in a petrilineal mold, I said, you know, basically we are such a, you know, wonderful, seemingly very, you know, beautiful metrilineal society, yet we uh, seem to be stuck in a petrilineal mold, you know, uh, you know, and is that a desirable trend? Definitely no. Uh, you know, what comes to my mind is, uh, you know, is this really the outcome, you know, because we're talking about the role of women in the modern Bhutanese society. And then modern, what is modern? Modern is really a product of, you know, all the development that has gone on so far, the progress that the country's achieved, you know, a result of edu modern education and, you know, exposure of, you know, the educated, having traveled the world and seen, you know, the, you know, development around the, uh, around the globe, actually. And so, you know, my question is, you know, is this then what we see, this contrast of uh, the myth of equality not being in sync with the actual reality you know, is this really the outcome or the impact of the so-called development per se, the progress, the education exposure, the modernization of our society? You know, you know what is our really society evolving into? You know, uh, basically, it's a myth of gender equality versus a reality of patriarchy, and patriarchy. I think uh, you know patriarchal norms, values. You know influence and dominate in all spheres, actually, if we really examine, uh, you know, very gender egalitarian, seemingly gender egalitarian society, if we really examine very deeply, 
it, you know, patriarchal norms and values, uh, you know, at a very subconscious level also seem to dominate in all our spheres, actually. We have to be so careful, you know, starting from home, in the workplaces, in school, you know, whether it is in media, you know, in so, in so many of our, you know, so-called, you know, so-called, you know, age-old traditions and customs and you know, practices and rituals that, you know, we really uh, uphold. Consider, you know, men to be superior to women, you know, uh, you know, very, very overtly, actually, in some cases we have where women are, in a way, discriminated or subordinated, actually. And this we have really seen uh, affecting and impacting uh, you know, and really coming, becoming a hindrance to women, uh, you know, getting elected in, in the elections, uh, whether it is in parliamentary elections, uh, whether it is in the local and particularly in the local government elections, uh, because for us, uh, we have been very intimately actually engaged, uh, my organization has been, uh, has been intimately engaged in the local government elections. And we've seen uh, you know, there in some of the districts, we have these uh, local festivals where local leaders have to be, you know, dressed uh, uh, in monk robes and ride horses and, you know, uh, attend, let's say, the Punaka Domchen, the famous, the festival of Punaka. And uh, to that, there are certain yokes, uh, local governments of the Timpu and Punaka ha who have to participate. And it's always a problem because there are very strong women candidates who we've prepared to participate in elections, but uh, you know, the, the, the local mindset of you know, the people and the communities is that you know, if we elect women into those positions, then it's going to bring bad luck. Uh, you know, we might have famine, we might have diseases, whatever, you know, all kinds of bad, bad uh, things will you know, fall on our society and community and it's not auspicious, etc. And then, you know, how can, you know, it's always been men. So how can women uh, you know, ride a horse and, you know, dress as a monk and participate in the Punadomchen, things like that, you know? And then there are other rituals of, you know, offering, making offerings uh, to local uh, protector deities at the beginning of every uh, important occasion where the local leader, whoever is the highest in, you know, the position, highest in position in that area, uh, or that organization must lead such a ritual. It's called the marchang, you know, offering the marchang. And those have always been traditionally done by men, obviously, because, you know, men have always been there in the public sphere and women were not there before. So men have done it, but now it's in the people's, you know, brains and, you know, it's in, deep in their mindset that only men should do it. And if women do it, it's not, in, it's not auspicious. So, no, so, you know, so these are things that, uh, in the, at a very subconscious level, you know, these bias, biases, uh, you know, uh, become a hindrance to women getting elected, although they may be, uh, they are, in fact, we have seen in, in many places, in many local governments, there were stronger and better, more capable, more qualified women candidates who would have been better leaders, yet they could not get elected just because of these kind of, you know, a cultural gender stereotyped mindsets, you know, that really held people back from giving their votes to women, you know. So these unconscious, you know, uh, biases really uh, come in the way of women. And, uh, you know, again, talking about uh, patriarchy, and I remember in the, uh, you, you said the film was made by this, I mean, the, the film Red Phallus, and I'm sure many of you have seen that. We are also, you know, on one hand, a very matrilineal, very, you know, um, respecting women, regarding women, you know, very matrilineal society. Yet, you know, we really celebrate the phallus, you know. And I, for me personally, I feel, you know, uh, I mean, people always say, then, you know, I mean, people who have been to Bhutan, I'm sure, as uh, Dr. Er Ermila knows phalluses are painted all over the you know, main entrance of the houses, hung on every corner of the uh, you know, roof, etc., to keep the evil spirits away, to protect the family, etc. So, you know, it's again, I feel it's a really a, a symbol of a very macho society, you know, where, I mean, women and modesty and ma male phallus is celebrated and really, you know, something to be proud of, you know. Uh, so that's for me. It is a symbol of a macho, macho society because 
we really celebrate the phallus. It goes all over the place in the public sphere. So, you know, it's, it is really, um, you know, for me, the other thing is that uh, I feel these things, these, these aspects make, uh, you know, the role of women and for women to find their, you know, uh, their befitting roles in modern Bhutanese society, quite a challenge and uh, quite complex also, because while, you know, women have changed and women are changing and we are, you know, adapting to the modern times and the opportunities that it offers and it, you know, and the demands that are there, you know, because we want to be out there, we want to be seen, we want to be heard, we want to, you know, be at the table, at the decision-making, ta- uh, you know, in the decision-making levels, etc. cetera. Uh, and then of course we are grappling uh, and struggling with our, you know, the, the, the gender stereotypical roles and which we don't complain about, of course, our triple roles. So women, you know, want to be in leadership positions and women, even though you make it to the leadership positions, it doesn't mean that you give up on the home front, you know? So it, those are there. But yet, I think, uh, you know, we are, we are so many, I think so many women who are in leadership today, I think the role models that we have, I think uh, are actually paving the way and showing that women can do it because it's just that, you know, as long as we don't get the opportunities, there's no way for us to showcase our leadership. But I think our women who, through the blessings of His Majesty, the King's, you know, initiatives, and I think through various royal decrees, et cetera, I think we had many strong role models, women role models that Dr. Elvila also mentioned. And then lately also we have many more who are in current positions. They may be a handful, but they are strong, strong role models. Um, um, I'll, I'll just, <laughs> we'll come back to this and then we, I think, uh, talk about examples um, and uh, go into the specifics soon. Um, I'd like to bring in um, Sring Dolkar at this point um, and then maybe talk about um, social social progress now. So um, Sring Dolkar, as I introduced earlier, um, is the executive director of Renew, has done a lot of social work, um, especially um, in an area that was stigmatized until very recently and even to this day continues a bit of stigma. So they've been pioneers in the field um, of helping women uh, survivors, um, enabling them in society, giving them um, a very, um, I would say, emancipating them in a way as well. And uh, Her Majesty, um, uh, Her Majesty the Gellium um, has been such a pioneer leading this uh, fearlessly. Um, I'm also also touched upon how she talked about the myth of equality in the reality of uh, patriarchy. And even in this area, it seems to be so. Uh, so now I'd like to invite Amsring Dolkar um, to talk about how uh, women, the roles of women have evolved over time, especially in the context of social progress. La. Um, you have to unmute Lam Tringolkar. Okay, thank you, Lam. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, well, um, as I've been introduced, I don't want to uh, you know, repeat that. So uh, I would like to, in the interest of time, I would like to straight away go into the, into the topic. And uh, uh, we're talking about role of women in Bhutan. And uh, I think it's very evident in the in the uh, what involvement in initiatives and works that has been done by our women in the royal family. And when I talk about the women in our royal family, I'm talking about their majesties, the queen mothers, and her majesty, the queen, the present queen, who have you know uh, shown so much of strength and led by examples, you know, especially in the areas of uh, the social, uh, social sector. And uh, uh, in, in, the, in the areas of work that I do, you know, I have been uh, working uh, in the uh, empowerment of women, especially women who have, uh, who, women who are vulnerable and uh, also, you know, are survivors of uh, domestic violence, gender-based violence, sexual abuse and uh, uh, sexual harassment, and also uh, in the areas of suicide, mental health and uh, trauma. Uh, these are the, some of the areas 
that you know uh, are silently silently uh, born uh, by our uh, women and these are the areas that cannot be seen so in this area her majesty Ma, the patron of renew her majesty uh, gelim sangye children wongchuk has been a pioneer and has been so uh, brave enough to break the silence of uh, violence in our country and uh, has has been also the the actor who has uh, taken up uh, the uh, domestic prevention of domestic violence 2013 act uh, which is now uh, very predominantly being used uh, by all uh, uh, all service providers and uh, uh, i i take this opportunity to thank her majesty for bringing women in the forefront and also also um, addressing gender equality gender equity and you know so, uh, so many areas that has been uh, 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 you know these these are areas that are very new to bhutan and even in times in memorial you can also see that uh, the women strong women of bhutan were always the women who were you know in the in the uh, role of um, uh, the leaders in the communities and also uh, the the uh, the queens that uh, were uh, in the past so with that uh, i would like to also talk uh, talk about an anecdote that uh, when it was sometime in 1990 uh, i was in college i was in the third year of my college and uh, i remember that day when his majesty the fourth king of bhutan came to visit the college where i was studying and uh, we were all preparing for the 75 year plan then and uh, we were all asked to come up with a, a presentation and i was given the topic you know this takes me back to the topic women's role in development never did i imagine myself talking about it after how many decades you know after college and there i was talking about women's representation in in the parliament you know in the Na national assembly and uh, i was you know very uh, innocently putting up and talking about you know the requirement for quota <laughs> quota system 25% of women's uh, you are you know uh, presence in the national assembly and his majesty was very candid you know and he did yeah there was a lot of discussion and his majesty talked about why you know we need that and why women cannot come you know stand and uh, you know uh, become equal uh, you, uh, you know like come up and uh, and face the reality you know to fight against your uh, your positions so never did i realize that uh, we would have women representation in our uh, assembly now so why i'm talking about this is i i feel at that time although i was very innocent i did make a small dent or a small impression on uh, our majesty and uh, his majesty was very kind and uh, he joked and he said oh you you boys in the college you must be you know harassing the women in the uh, in the college so therefore in order to support them i am going to present you on a generator you know electricity generator and that's how you know the college that i studied in sherabse college we were uh, we were given a generator generator which is still you know in the college now so why i'm talking about is this is i did play my part although it was a very different topic i did play my part and you know made a difference in getting we, we had lights when the lights went off we didn't have to stay in the dark we had generator and uh, which gave us light so i'm just putting it up as a as a joke or to to just lighten up the moods but then i promised myself that i am going to make a difference in the development in no matter how small a role i play i must must make some some uh, 
changes in the society. You know, that's how uh, I began my career in Renew. And, uh, and uh, in Renew, we have, you know, programs such as uh, prevention, intervention, and, and reintegration. So uh, the services that we provide in this area has benefited women and uh, has empowered them. And uh, maybe uh, one day we hope that these, these women would, you know, provide their services. The women who have been empowered now would lead by example and provide these services to women who are, you know, also in the same situation and in the same position that they have been uh, some time ago. So we have served, uh, provided our services about uh, 100,174 thousand services in uh, Renew to empower our women. And uh, one of the core services that we have is the counseling services, the shelter services, the legal aid, you know, and then the microfinance, which is from the German bank. Uh, I think it's called the Sparkson Bank in Germany, which is serving, you know, our women. And one of the most, uh, most, uh, mm, um, benef benefiting services that we have provided is the livelihood skills development. Together with the microfinance and the livelihood skills services, we have been able to really, you know, uh, create income generating uh, services. And, uh, 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 you know, from that, our, our women have uh, really been empowered and, uh, you know, we hope that through this, you know, domestic violence and gender violence, violence we can we can really uh, prevent it in the future. For now, I would like to just say this much. Maybe in the future, in the later discussions, questions may come up. And uh, may I now hand over to Namgi. Thank you. Thank you, Altering Dalkar, um, for sharing that. Uh, from the two speakers, you've heard that um, not everything is, um, gross national happiness in Bhutan. Although we are guided by the development philosophy, when you really take apart the pieces, then you see that, um, like, you know, how you have, um, I always like to compare it to a mosaic um, and even glass painting, right? There are different pieces. When you look at them carefully, some of them are not perfect. But when you move back and then you look at the whole picture, it does appear to be beautiful. We aren't a perfect society. And I think uh, the panel here tonight is very candid about this. Uh, but we're also discussing things that work in Bhutan, like things that are being done correctly. Um, examples like Amphan Zok and Amphan Zok are uh, moving away from governance um, and uh, uh, social, the social sphere. We're going to move to Amsana um, Mongmo, who is actually a real trailblazer. So um, she entered the field of entrepreneurship when the word entrepreneur itself wasn't being flung about, wasn't mainstream. Um, only in retrospect are we applying the term to Amsana um, Mongmo. She, uh, she entered the field of travel when travel was an entirely new concept to uh, many, many Bhutanese. Um, so Nam, if you could share with us what your journey's been like, how you got into um, uh, travel and basically um, starting in a sector that was not, uh, women weren't leading as you were in the time. And if you could share how the evolution has happened from your time and what you see today, Lam Good evening to everyone. I hope you can hear me and especially uh, good evening to Ermal. I'm so happy to see you after many, many years. Really nice. I, I was so delighted to know that you are on the panel. So well, my greetings to you from Bhutan, Ermela, first, okay? And now, uh, as Namgyi would want to hear about my getting into business, it's been a very interesting journey for me. I mean, it was those days in the 19th just a uh, homemaker raising my children. And I think by then I already had about three children. And, uh, you know, it, it just came along and I just fell into it. And uh, it's all without the plan, but I was just pushed into it and I just took it on. 
And like uh, in those days in the government, I mean, like if your husband is working with the government and you were not allowed to get in, you know, do or get yourself in, into business and things like that. But somehow that I pursued that. And then I also happened to be very lucky to be in a situ in, in, in the position that I'm in now. And uh, so it's been a very interesting journey. And then I started my travel business in 1985 and uh, comparing to now and that time when we were working is it's, it's, it's like when I look back, it's, uh, I, I feel it's such a big change with the new technology now and those days. And I started my business, especially with the ticketing, catering to uh, making arrangements to all the government officials traveling outside and uh, being the only I, mean, I would say that I think I was one of the first women who got into it. And uh, like I said, I've been lucky. And then those days, if you had to, you know, when you have to make a travel itinerary, now you have to go to the offices with two thick books, which is called ABC book. And that was the, uh, you know, you have to make all the travel itinerary and reading that book and then not like this days, just click on a button and then where you get all the information. And it's been a very fun and exciting journey and uh, you could really feel. And then I have so many friends those days, you know, when I was uh, doing this and they say, oh, you are the one who actually made my first uh, uh, travel arrangement, who did the ticketing to my, to the first trip to abroad. So if you had that kind of a connection, personal connection. And then of course, and how we had to do those things, was we had to get all the ticketing from Calcutta and there was no true care flights. We had to get them through the post, through Bhaktugra and things like this. And all the itineraries, everything we had to get through the phone. And of course we didn't have, uh, uh, I mean like uh, communication system was not as efficient as now. Those days you had to call and the trunk call it was. So you had to make a trunk booking, which took us almost about two to three hours to connect ourselves to India to get all the information. So of course, then you give all the information, they would do all the ticketing and send it up. And sometime, well, uh, there are lapses where people, you know, where it, things goes wrong and you can't make any changes. And sometimes people will miss the flight and they were not so happy with your service, but they had no choice because they had to travel with me. But I was the only one who was doing the, uh, uh, you know, doing the arrange travel arrangements. So we, Joe, can then connect ourselves with the clients and then bond it very well. So it was been a very fun, uh, fun time at, you know, how I started my business. So it's, and then after that, we moved into tourism, and that was in uh, 1990, early 90s, when we, we moved to tourism, and it was in trekking. So I started trekking, and I was working with all, suddenly I realized that I was working with all men. So I had all my trekking staff, and, you know, I was only the person who was actually, uh, when I look back, and I said, or especially going trekking and traveling. Uh, I mean, like, you know, doing, I did all the snowman trek and I did all the travel, uh, uh, covered all the trekking routes those days. And then suddenly I realized that I'm with all the men, about 10, 15 men, and then there I was leading. And so it's, when I look back, I feel that I have achieved quite a bit and I feel very satisfied with what I've done. I think the interesting thing about you, I'm sorry, um, you never, it was, it was never a conscious decision to be a path, um, I think to be a pioneer or a trailblazer. You were just doing things like you were saying in a way, almost going with the flow. But then now when you look back, I think you do realize that um, it was very radical at that point in time. Yeah, it was when I'm like, you know, with no plan. It just, I was just thrown into it and then I just took it on and everything moved very smoothly. And, and it's been a lot of, a lot of excitement and fun working with what I've been doing. And then of course, working for yourself and uh, it gave you so much of a freedom and you could do what you want. 
and then certain if you you know you make up your mind then you do what you need to do if you have a clear for heart and things like that and if you put your mind into it it's nothing stops you from doing it so i had no problem uh doing what i wanted to do so <laughs> I think um, Sunam's um, experience is so important to share with everybody who's joined in the panel and even whether you're a Putinese or not, because I think a lot of Putinese young women um, and even young men think that uh, it's only in this day and age that women are so independent and so powerful and um, so rebellious. But then I think the original rebel is women like you, I'm Sunam, and <laughs> I'm so glad um, that we have you on the panel today. La. Um, I want to move to Amphan Sok uh, for a while and uh, you uh, bring in um, your views on how, um, when you speak about gender, you're talking about the myth of equality versus reality of patriarchy and how you feel that um, uh, when we actually look through the gender lens that there are so many deficits um, when it comes to gender um, and put down. So if you could maybe your comments on um, how our government has worked with gender, uh, have there been improvements, um, or what, is there a critique or appreciation of what has happened so far, particularly how we move ahead with the five-year plan. So then uh, we have our development measured and guided by something called the five-year plans. And um, this was brought in by, from India again. So I just wanted to hear Amphan Sook's uh, views on this, especially since you've worked in this area for so long now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, thank you Namge. Uh, basically, I think uh, government, uh, you know, especially as you've also mentioned earlier, the under the you know uh, umbrella of the National Commission for Women and Children, I think have always been making uh, you know efforts to try and mainstream gender because uh, Bhutan is signatory to many international conventions, including you know the. Uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDO in particular, I think, uh, and then various other conventions. So therefore, uh, and then of course, the most recent being the SDG uh, goals, you know, that have to be met as well. So I think right from the, you know, 10th five-year plan onwards, government actually has been making concerted efforts, uh, the National Plan of Action for Gender, uh, you know, from 2008 to 2013 in the 10th year plan uh, was uh, one initiative uh, that was led by the National Commission for Women and Children to try and mainstream gender across all the agencies and sectors. Then in the 11th five-year plan, I think, uh, you know, it was further mainstreamed and I think into the five-year plan proper by actually uh, having within the five-year plan itself a national key result area, which is, uh, uh, you know, which was titled Gender Friendly Environment for Women Participation. And, uh, you know, in fact, that was actually around the time that was Binu, uh, the organization that, you know, uh, which I am driving and which I'm leading right now, uh, was conceptualized around 2012 when the, and mandated by all the elected women who were elected in 2008 and 2011. And we, uh, you know, came together to be a networking platform to really facilitate, you know, and build capacity and confidence of women. And of course, to mobilize also and prepare women for future elections, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, so around that time, after we were kind of conceptualized and we were, you know, beginning to operate, was it the, you know, the, the 11 five-year plans, uh, NKRA on the gender-friendly environment, which had a particular, you know, key, uh, you know, key performance indicator, uh, which was to draft a legislation to ensure quotas for women in, um, you know, elected offices, including parliament and local government. And this was like really in black and white, in the 11 five-year plan, which really got us excited as NCWC and BNU. And that was when in 2013, uh, right after the second parliamentary elections, you know, uh, BNU together with the National Commission, we organized the first, uh, you know, national conference on women in politics, where we brought together some, you know, over 200 uh, people and we had, uh, you know, the, the government, uh, we, we actually were trying to rope in the prime minister to deliver the keynote address because we were so excited by the uh, government's uh, commitment as well to draft a legislation, you know. 
But uh, yeah, lo and behold, in 2016, the government withdrew uh, there because you know it, within the government's five-year plan, this uh, key performance indicator was there. And the political party that actually won the elections and the second parliamentary election, which was the PDP, had actually also made a pledge to draft legislation. So it was really in sync. The party pledge was in sync with the five-year plan, and that really got us excited. But it was not to be. In 2016, uh, the party dropped its pledge, and we were a bit, bit disappointed. However, uh, I think in the 12th five-year plan, that was from 2018 to 2023, uh, the you know once again the government you know continues uh, the I think uh, basically led by the Gross National Happiness Commission, and uh, together with the National Commission, did not give up. And uh, once again, uh, they have formulated a national key result area uh, called gender equality and women empowerment. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so at the moment, uh, that uh, is uh, uh, what the National Commission for Women and Children is driving. Uh, we, Binu, we have MOU with the National Commission for Women and Children, and we try to work particularly on uh, you know, a plan of action that the NCWC has drawn up called the National Plan of Action for Gender Equality in Elected Offices. So that is primarily for uh, for raising awareness and you know building capacity and uh, yeah and uh, we are trying to advocate very strongly for temporary special measures to be adopted uh, by, by either tweaking policies or having some kind of legislation but um, we've not gotten very far with it and we uh, as namge you're also aware uh, Binu has led and together with the National Commission for Women and Children, we also launched um, the Bhutan Women Parliamentary Caucus, which we are hosting. And that is also, you know, an instrument or a platform within Binu and with the, with the, in partnership with NCWC and with the parliament, we try to orient parliamentarians and trying to, you know, really sensitize parliamentarians and try to work on a partnership with the parliament to try and work towards uh, some sort of a, you know, uh, legal legislative, uh, you know, transformations or changes, introductions to uh, have temporary special measures in place. Because at the moment uh, I realize uh, increasingly, uh, you know, given the current situation, I feel that unless we have some sort of a policy tweak or a legislative tool, um, it is going to be very difficult for Bhutan to meet uh, particularly its obligation towards achieving gender equality, you know, uh, within the framework of the SDG, because uh, SDG goal number five is to achieve planet 5050 by 2030. And we are nowhere, uh, you know, uh, to reaching that goal, uh, you know, forget planet 5050, I think it's going to be difficult even to achieve, you know, 2080. So we hope that, you know, with the efforts that the government's making and with the little things that we are able to do as the civil society organization, and of course we are constantly working together with media organizations like JAB and, you know, and others, uh, we uh, hope that uh, somewhere along the line, uh, you know, the, the there's more, you know, uh, people who agree with us and we can try to get some sort of a temporary special measure in place for Bhutan. Otherwise, without that, I think no matter what we do, it's going to be very difficult because some, sometimes I think top-down measures are required because bottom-up, you know, just simply through awareness raising and mobilizing and preparing, it's not enough to, you know, raise uh, the numbers of women in leadership. And I think some special measures are required. And just like back in 1998, you know, when His Majesty the Fourth King issued a royal decree to the National Assembly to do something about, you know, raising women representation, that year in the National Assembly, you know, I think the women representation uh, then in pre-democracy days went up from, let's say, zero to 14%. So I think, you know, some, some sort of a top-down measures are required if you want to translate uh, the goodwill in the constitution of Bhutan as well as all our international you know all our international commitments 
I think there's no other way. I think we have to find a fast track measure. Less, less something. So thank you. Um, we've really out. I think um has really pointed out um the glaring gaps <laughs> when it comes to gender in Putini society. And I know you feel very passionate about this because you've worked so long and so hard in this sphere. And I've worked along with you as well, and you've opened my eyes to a lot of things in Bhutan that are not really visible um at first sight. Uh, we have some questions coming in, so um I want. Uh, maybe I'm Tring Dolker to take this. Um, so the question is actually from someone called uh, Tring Chodin uh, via Facebook. And uh, the question is, do you think with modernization, Putini society has actually progressed in our thinking about gender equality or have we somehow regressed and still struggle with accepting strong women uh, beyond women leaders who look, act and behave like men? So um, what do you think? Like, do you want me to repeat the question or is this clear? Yeah, I think the second part do you mind repeating uh, the um, second part? Putin's society has actually progressed in our thinking. Do you think we progressed in our thinking on gender equality? Or have we somehow regressed and still struggle with accepting strong women? Um, instead, uh, we seem to be accepting women who uh, look, act, and behave like men, apparently. Do we have to be like that to be accepted is the question, Imam. Well, I for this question, I look at myself, and I consider myself a very strong woman who can make a lot of difference in wherever, wherever I'm working. But uh, I don't think I look and act like a man. So <laughs> taking that, I think, uh, I don't think we need to look like a man and act like a man to be accepted uh, as, you know, uh, in, the, in the areas of uh, gender equality. It's uh, how you uh, how you uh, really um, educate, how you accept, and how you really behave in the sense like in your understanding of uh, being sensitive to uh, different genders is what I I feel you know uh, we need to really work on and not really you know uh, fight for our rights you know because uh, I think in Bhutan. Uh, our policies, our, um, you know, we all know that our monarchs have given us a lot of, you know, a platform, the equity, you know, is there, how you utilize it it's in our hand. And uh, we, we in, like in other countries, we don't have to really be a feminist. We don't have to really fight for our rights. You know, it's how you take up your role in, in really uh, not being discriminated and not being, you know, bullied or harassed. You know? So uh, what I, I actually uh, am trying to say is, you know, the second part of the question where we don't need to really behave like a man to be accepted by another man. You can still be a woman and still, you know, be accepted. If we, as, you know, as a society, know how to really provide support to each other. So this is uh, what I think. I don't think we have regressed. I think uh, gender equality, you know, uh, is moving forward with so many uh, very strong leaders in the country. And, uh, you know, the representation here is here itself that, you know, we will only progress. It's just that uh, it needs time. And we should not be. We should not really give, give, uh, um, lose hope. I think the policies are there. The uh, you know platform is there. It's just that the implementation part is in the hands of all you know all the women out there to really uh, support each other. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I don't think it's just, I think um, it really is on the individual as well, like Amstring was saying. And uh, 
it, it isn't just all the, the onus isn't just on institutions, but then it's really about being um so being me, Namgizam, being Amstring Dolkar, and none of us are men, look like men or behave like men, <laughs> like you were saying. But I think in the Bhutanese context, we do have some sayings when you know um, the idea of strength, uh, power is associated with the man, like Amfin Sook was referring to the phallus and machismo in Bhutan. So I think it, it stems from that. Um, Amsonam, I wonder if you could take this question. Um, it comes from Mr. Reinhard Wolf, uh, the president of German Bhutan Himalaya Society. And he asks, when do you think we'll have a female prime minister in Bhutan? <laughs> um, you have to unmute yourself, La. Um, good evening, Reinhardt. Good to know that you're also on this program, yeah? And I trust that you come up with this question. <laughs> well, I think it's very difficult to predict when we will have a lady prime minister. Well, although we have a lot of uh, capable uh, female who can take on the job, but I think it's, from my point of view, I feel it's up to the, uh, you know, herself, whether she wants with the decision whether she wants to pursue it with um, um, uh, the, whether you, you know, I'm mean, like to take such a huge task on yourself, whether you want to really go or you want to, you, you choose to be what you want to do, right? So, but we, even we, when we have a lot of uh, good candidates, but this decision is hers. But sometimes when you think that even if you want to do it, but then you are, uh, you have so much responsibilities. Like you have to play the role of a mother, you have to play the role of a wife, and then you have to play a lot of roles. And the women have much more role to play than the men. I'm sorry, Mr. Reinhardt, but that's the, that's the truth. And uh, if you want to be a career, strong-minded career person, we have a lot of capable women who can definitely be a prime minister, and I'm sure they will make a good prime minister. I mean, I'm sure there are women who want to get up and stand for prime minister if there is an environment conducive to her being a whole woman. If she wants to be a parent, she can be a parent. Um, if she wants to be the prime minister, she can. If she wants to be more, if she's allowed to juggle all this with the kind of support that I think men receive, I think any woman is capable. Um, so can have had in-depth discussions on this. Thanks, um, Sonoma, for sharing that. You were mentioning how women um, juggle time, if they have the time and resources they can. I also want to touch upon this topic of volunteerism, uh, which is suddenly picking up now, I think, among millennials and the younger generation. But um, Sonoma, you happen to be the OG, as we say <laughs> in urban lingo, original volunteer. Um, tell us how this volunteerism happened and what made it possible for you to volunteer and uh, what caused you to volunteer? Okay, uh, on the volunteerism. Now, you know, we, we, you know, when we, uh, you hear with so many criticism saying we are, oh this is not functioning or the government should do this you know we had so many criticism we are only criticizing but we're not doing anything so me and my other three friends like i'm Ugandema and i'm dinky and things like that so we had this kind of a discussion in fact when i was going to england irmala when i was going to see uh dragana to see her and to attend to her and that's when I got to spend more time in Delhi waiting for my visa. So I'm Ogundum, I was staying with Amogundum. So then we were just talking as a woman. And then he was saying, oh my goodness, this doesn't function. This doesn't function. You know, so all what you hear is the system is not functioning. So then I, and we came up with an idea. He said, instead of criticizing, I said, let's try to do something and see if we can make a change. So we thought to make a change and to volunteer ourselves will be good to pick on with the hospital. Because hospital is where a lot of people come and that's we thought you know, we could do something to make a little change. So then Amma Windyama, she said, okay, then let's do it. So I said, okay, she, uh, Dinky is a professional trained nurse and uh, I'm Damcho and I'm Ugindyama. So they were all health background who was trained, I think, uh, they went to England and in New Zealand to be trained as uh, in the nursing. 
So they came back and they were working, but they were no longer in the service. So, and I, uh, I'm the one who didn't, you know, ha have any of this uh, background. But then we built this idea together, and then I'm um, Ogindema, and we wrote a proposal to the hospital and gave a proposal to the hospital, offering a free service. But the hospital they took one year to take accept a uh, 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 offer. So anyway, they agreed, we signed an MOU, and then we thought what we could do. So the first thing what we came up was with queuing up to create an awareness, queuing up. Because if you go to the hospital, you will see everybody rushing. You know, things like, so we thought maybe let's see if we can also create a little awareness and also educate our people, saying that government is providing a free service. So we should also respect and all not demanding you know, so things that so we want to give both uh, help assisting the hospital and also creating a little awareness that we as a citizen should be also responsible and we should also be grateful to the government for the free services that we enjoy now. So that's how we started. And then we signed an agreement for about two years. And then we, our uh, initial idea was we would maybe do on two days, in a month on a rotation basis, and if you could have more uh, volunteers. But uh, we got about 100 plus people who signed up and gave an induction, uh, introduction and things like this, and then presentation to the hospital and with all the volunteers. But then eventually it's, it, didn't, it did not work that way. So but dealing with people is not easy. And we had a lot of young uh, girls who was volunteering. And then it is, you know, in the hospital, how people are, they're demanding services and then they get quite aggressive at times. So later on, it came down to just a few of us. And then we realized if you want to volunteer, uh, you just don't do it just for the sake of doing it. You have to have the heart to do it and then enjoy what you're doing to make a difference. So then we had full dedicated members who would, uh, who was willing to do this. And then for me, especially after, okay, we signed up and we offered our services. So we have to make it up, you know, a difference and let the hospital feel that we are not just, you know, fooling around. So took this shoulder on myself. And then but from two years, we went up to three and a half years, not realizing that it be a uh, part-time uh, supposed to be a couple of hours in a day, but it came to a full-time working from morning nine to five. And I would go on till about 10, 11, but you would have a lot of people who needed the service uh, from all walks of life. And then we, uh, and then I started enjoying and like our, our other friends as well. And then we continued to work for three and a half years. And then, but that's how you see at least queuing is a little bit in place. And then people respect standing in your line and not just uh, overcrowding yourself. So basically I enjoy doing such work. So Thank That's you, thank you Anton, yeah. for sharing your experience. Yeah. I think yours is such a fine example to illustrate how women, if you really take women on board, we are hardly ever a part of the problem, but always a part of the solution. And I think that's so great. I think your example is um, so good. And uh, thank you for sharing your story. Um, Finsok, I want you to answer this question, even though I was the one who made the reference, because I know for a fact that you have worked with them and have uh, a lot to share. But if you could keep it brief, because we're almost touching 11.30 now. So the question um is you all at some point referred to the Indian experience. India indeed has a quota for women even and especially at a local and village level. Are you in touch with civil society representatives from India in order to draw conclusions from the Indian experience? And this comes from Frank Hoffman, Lamfinsuk, if you could answer this question. Um, yeah, yes, actually uh, in India, we worked uh, very closely uh, with the, the Hunger Project that uh, basically has been working with the Panchayat women, especially in the Panchayats, because in India they have this, although by the 73rd and 74th Amendment of the Constitution of India, there is a you know, mandatory 33% reserved uh, you know, seats for in all the Panchayats. 
but the states have now actually gone further to increase it to 50%. In most, in fact, almost all the states of India, they've actually gone up now to 50% women in the panchayats. Because they say, you know, I mean, when the women make up 50% of society, why should it be 33%? It should be 50%. So, you know, that was very inspiring for us. And in fact, uh, we've had the opportunity when we had the funds available to also take uh, our women on, you know, some of our elected women from local governments to, you know, have some exposure and sharing experiences with panchayats in, in India. Uh, in, you know, in the south of India, in Kerala, also in Gujarat and uh, in Delhi, we have uh, actually done some exchange with them. And we've had um, resource people from the Hunger Project coming over to Bhutan also, and we've uh, done some quite some good work together. So yes, we are in, in touch with this particular organization in India, which uh, they work across seven or eight states. Uh, yes, and uh, there are I mean, the, how these women in the panchayats work after they are elected through the quota system is very interesting and very inspiring. And, you know, uh, it, it was really helpful for our women to see them. And they, in fact, some of our women came back with, you know, highly inspired and got some good ideas. And that really helped them to, you know, do new things in their own local governments here as well. And it really moved them to see uh, because in Bhutan, compared to the women serving in panchayats in India, our women are in a fairly comfortable position where they are almost like civil servants. You know, they get salaries and, you know, they get travel allowances and all that. Whereas in India, in the panchayats, you know, you're really on your own. You barely get 200 bucks to just attend a assembly. That's all. <clears throat> you don't get salaries, etc. So from that point of view also, our women felt that they need to do more. So those women who were able to benefit from, you know, meeting women in panchayats in India, uh, really felt, you know, that they needed to do much more. They needed to work harder in Bhutan. So it, it is a really, I always say that uh, for our women uh, in local governments, they don't have to go further than India to really learn and exchange uh, and uh, pick up ideas from there. Lassam, Lassam, thank you. Uh, we're going to begin wrapping up, but I have a very specific question for Amsung Dolka. Mm -hmm. It's an area that we haven't touched, and it's such an important area, um, especially this year. Her Majesty the Queen actually um, really spearheaded and actually um, was a catalyst for the mental health movement, I would say. Um, she's instituted uh, a separate section in the Hospital for Mental Health Care and Wellbeing. Amsung Dolka instituted the Bhutan Board for Certified Counselors. She's the first certified counselor in Bhutan. Um, the question I have for you is, you know, we whenever people talk about Bhutan, gross national happiness is bound to come up, always comes up. But I want to ask you, how happy are Bhutanese women in Bhutan now? Very interesting question. It's a, a, a million dollar question. And uh, to that, I, I really don't know how happy they are. But if you ask me how happy you are, I'm a very happy person, you know, and uh, I, I hope everybody is happy, but which is not. You know, the, the happiness of a person does not only depend on uh, what you have or who you are or uh, where you are, you know. Happiness de depends upon your mental state of mind. And I think uh, if you really look at the state of mind, I think uh, a lot of our people in Bhutan, unfortunately, I. Uh, as per my experience and the women that I've seen have uh, a lot of issues. You know, most, I feel like uh, if this, the Pema Center uh, initiated by her, her, by her Majesty, uh, the Queen of Bhutan came at the right time. You know, we, uh, it was sought for a very long time. I remember, you know, about 20 years ago, you know, we were asking, we were talking about it, discussing about this issue, and uh, many people didn't understand what mental health issues was. So finally, now the time has come. You know, the time to provide services have come, and uh, it came at a very opportune time when you know, uh, you know, when the issues did not go out of hand. I think we still have uh, time to address it, and. Uh, 
you see a lot of uh, cases of depression, panic, anxiety, trauma, all you know, domestic violence. These are all uh, tr triggered by you know alcohol. These uh, the also especially women when we touch menopause, there there are a lot of things complications that go around menopause. You know, women uh, they lose uh, their interest um, in uh, not only in a relationship but also in many intimate things, you know, uh, within the family. And also they become lonely. The, the hormonal, you know, that uh, changes that take place has a handover, you know, it has power over us. And if you don't understand what is happening to you at the right time, you know, it, it causes a lot of problems for you and your family. And also like, you know, there's a lot of child abuse. There's a lot of, uh, um, rape, suicide, so many things, you know, that should have been identified at a younger age when, when children are growing up, you know, where we don't have the expertise and it has been carried up to, you know, at the adulthood and it has not been addressed and it becomes a full blown then disorder. And, you know, when you go to the hospital, there are so many, we have very less psychiatrists and, uh, you know, there are so many issues and I think, I think uh, uh, I cannot talk about uh, everyone, but uh, the women that I've seen have undergone, you know, uh, basically needs a lot of help and uh, not everybody is happy. And uh, there's a section of society who are vulnerable and will be going through a lot of uh, mental health issues so uh, that's, that's where you can come in but that's where you come in uh, women like you come in to help to guide women and then to provide them the support that is required like you're saying there are gaps but the gaps are being filled and you telling the story is showing us that we are moving ahead um, by accepting the fact that not everybody is happy in Bhutan women may not be happy in Bhutan as well but there's something that can be done about it so thank you so much Amsring for sharing this um, if I could hear very short closing remarks from Amsonam and Amsun so basically about the challenges and opportunities you see for women in a modern Putinese society. La. Amsonam, do you want to go first? La? Okay. Um, you've muted yourself. If you could unmute. Now is it okay? Yes, yes. Yeah. Now you can hear me. Okay, sorry. Yes, yeah, yes, <laughs> Oh, what was the question again? Yeah. Um, if so, what, what last, okay. or challenges do you see for Putinese women like, in modern Putinese society? Oh, I think the uh, opportunity now in the uh, modern world for the Buddhist society for all the upcoming young girls, uh, I think uh, there's no end to it, especially with the technology. Uh, you can see a lot of young girls coming up and uh, with different ideas. And because you can get all the information from the you know, Google and from there's so much information that you, you can get. So people, these days, you don't even need to go anywhere. You can just sit in your uh, one room and then just if you're uh, very internet savvy and you can do anything. So I can see a lot of young girls and there's no end to it. I can see they, they can really go very far. And, and then, of course, because they're open to, they have a lot of exposure now comparing to those days. So they have a lot of uh opportunity I can see, you know, ahead of them. There are a lot of capable young girls. Uh, I see they're very enterprising too. Thank you so much, Amsonam. Thank you, La Amsonam. Yeah. Um, I think for me, I want to actually, uh, to answer this question, I also want to build on the question that was asked uh, earlier by somebody saying, uh, to be a strong leader, do you have to act like a man? 
and be accepted uh, in Bhutan. Oh yeah, um, actually, she actually sent one back. So if you could just listen to this before you answer, she said her question yeah. was a little misunderstood. What she was trying to say was get our view on Bhutanese society's acceptance of strong women, women who raise their voice and do not fit into the traditional mold of how or what a woman should be. So um, what are your views on that? Is Bhutanese society accepting of strong women in Mela? Um, so if you could just put that uh, in. Okay, okay, yeah. Yes. Uh, Actually, I think Bhutanese society on the whole, I would say, is uh, very flexible and very accepting, very, you know, uh, and uh, I think so long as we dare to be strong and just like, you know, you uh, in the conversation you had with Amsalam earlier, you know, I think as long as we dare to be there and as long as we dare to be who we are, I think society is willing to accept us as we are. But I think that confidence has to be in us to be to be able to you know project ourselves as we want to be so i think uh, i would uh, my answer would be yes i think our society is got accepting so it's just that we shouldn't hesitate because the the the, the larger the bigger picture the environment is not very conducive because the the bigger you know the, the thoughts um, are that you know leadership is for men politics is for men so therefore you know in order to be accepted you must uh, uh, be, uh, you know, the typical, you must fit into the typical mold of, uh, you know, being a meek and being a very modest and humble woman. So I think that's not completely true for Bhutan. I would say in Bhutan, I think everything is chalega, as we say, you know, I think as long as we dare to be, I think people are willing to accept us. I think we have to be brave to, you know, uh, just be ourselves. Um, and then from that point of view, I feel that because of that, I think because of the kind of society we are, uh, you know, given the complexities that I presented earlier, I also feel, also I see a huge opportunity for Bhutan to actually create, instead of, you know, falling into the trap of a patrilineal mold that, you know, we see in the world around us and therefore we feel to be modernized, to be, you know, accepted uh, by the rest of the world, we need to, you know, also copy and uh, copy paste, uh, you know, uh, uh, even uh, traits of leadership. I feel we have the huge opportunity, given the, you know, the strong matrilineal traditions we have, we have the opportunity to really create a matrilineal mold of leadership as well, so that we can groom our young boys and men in the future to be, you know, uh, to be more, you know, uh, caring, more compassionate, more, you know, honest, uh, you know, these qualities uh, that are more inherent, inherently female, I think these can be nurtured in boys, young boys and men, so that in the future, I think, you know, not so long, not to find the future, I would say, we can actually have a more balanced, uh, you know, mode of leadership, uh, with there's a good blend, the best of both worlds, as we say, the best of the patriarchal norms, best of the you know matrilineal norms, we can actually blend. I think Bhutan has that environment, and I think that is a huge opportunity for us, because often when we do our leadership you know exercises and we look for you know traits, I think most of the time the kind of traits that we look in leaders, whether they are men or uh, women, I think most of the traits are very inherently inherently there naturally in women, you know whether it is, you know, you want a caring, you want an honest, you want a very, you know, responsible, the characteristics that are there in women, I think naturally, I think these are, you know, things that can be nurtured in men as well. So I think yeah. uh, we have a huge opportunity, opportunity in that, I would say, for yes. Uh, yes. nurturing, for really shaping and nurturing, a, you know, feminine mold of leadership. Yes. Thank you so much, Amphan Sok. I think uh, that's really beautiful and uh, such a unique opportunity for Bhutan. Um, Dr. Klein had actually asked about women-related studies. I wanted to answer this and save it for the end and say, we don't have gender studies in Bhutan or in the education curriculum, but this is an opportunity for our Ministry of Education to um, explore, I think, and then to add women, uh, to, to make women more visible in the curriculum uh, and then to make it more acceptable and then something to aspire towards, I think, from a young age. And um, also going back to the question about 
strong women leaders are we accepting? I just want, and I want to actually um, uh, attest to what um, Finsuk has shared. We are a flexible society open to change. I want to give you one example of women playing Kuru. Now, Kuru is a traditional game of darts in Bhutan. When women first started playing that, there was hue and cry all over the country. If there were hailstones or a hailstorm, they would blame it on the women playing the darts. If something went awry in nature, even the women were blamed because they said we were going against the force of nature. But guess what? Just last month in our neighborhood, there was a huge group of men and women playing darts together. And when they saw me, they said, can you not put it on social media though? And the women were winning at the game. And the men said, we want these women on my team. So imagine this happened within the span of three years. So change can really happen. And there's so much opportunity for Bhutan. And on that note, I want to close the panel and thank all our panelists uh, for your time tonight. And I want to hand over to Dr. Klein, who is the head of the regional office in South Asia. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, first of all, excellencies, uh, parliamentarians, and uh, dear ladies and gentlemen for this really very good, uh, deep, and insightful uh, discussion. Thanks especially to uh, all our panelists, Ms. Aum Sonam Wangmo, Ms. Aum Wanchuk Choden, Mrs. Chering Dolka, and uh, to our Excellent moderator, Mrs. Namgai Sam. Thanks, of course, also to you, uh, Dr. Hartz, Vice President of the German Bhutan Himalaya Society, for your continuous support. Yeah, we, I think we had and witnessed uh, just a, a very uh, good uh, discussion. And um, we in uh, Frisch Naumann Stiftung uh, believe that everywhere in the world, there is still a lot of room for entrusting women with the responsibilities they deserve in all facets of life, but also in our societies as a whole. So again, thank you very much for the discussion. Um, I could uh, proudly share with you that also in our foundation, we witness a new chapter. Um, we just see that uh, in the first time of our history, we have now a woman um, um, as uh, the CEO uh, in place. So uh, we are very, very happy to have her uh, with us now. Thank you very much again, um, especially um, to um, uh, the uh, colleagues um, from uh, the foundation. Uh, my dear colleagues, uh, um, Mrs. Uh, uh, Nupur Hasidra, uh, thanks uh, to the colleagues uh, in Bavaria, Mr. Schneer and Mr. Sions. Thank you for uh, the uh, communication support Mrs. Mishra and Mr. Bresnik. Special thanks to Mrs. Kama Jordan, uh, the alumnus of our uh, foundation. And of course, in uh, the name of uh, Friedrich Naumann Foundation in South Asia, I could say uh, very happily that we will continue this online series on Bhutan. And of course, uh, we are very happy that we have already started concrete active activities in Bhutan with our partner Bhutan Media Foundation. So again, um, at the end, uh, I would like to hand over these uh, uh, quite unique certificates of thank you uh, to all of you. Um, I, I deeply hope uh, that we will see each other in person in Bhutan, in India, or in Germany in person. Thank you again for this uh, uh, late night discussion, at least for us here in South Asia. I wish to all of you a very good Christmas time, especially to the listeners in, in Germany and around the world and have, of course, a very happy and prosperous and healthy new year, 2022. Thanks a lot and good night from South Asia.